Well, good morning, Grace Church. Uh, for the, if we haven't met yet, as Pastor West said, my name is Taylor Brown, and I am privileged to have with me a friend today. He's not just a friend, though. He is an author, a pastor, a speaker, the leader of a nonprofit here locally that's incredible, Will Hutcherson. Everyone say hi, Will. Did I, did I catch everything wow, that, that you're was, doing? You're a busy guy, Will. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, that was a lot of hype behind that one, too. So I yeah, appreciate <laughs> did, that. Did you want me to, uh, are you, you want me to like tone it down next time? So you, <laughs> you, I don't want to send you it to you. You do you. <laughs> um, so uh, I love Will, and I want Will to take just like 30 seconds to just share a little bit about, a little yeah. bit more deeper into that, about what you do, who you are, sure. and just sort of how you got to be doing this today. So I, I've been a pastor for over 15 years, and a couple years ago felt... Uh, very burdened by this issue of mental health. And so now I have a nonprofit that helps uh, kids and teenagers um, with issues of mental health. And myself and another guy named Malik, we travel the country and do school assemblies and public schools and private schools and help talk about hope and uh, help kids to, to see that there's always hope. But along with that, we also help parents. I'm a parent myself, by the way. I have three kids. Uh, I have an 11 year old, an eight year old, and a five year old. And uh, they're just amazing. And my wife and I are blessed with these amazing kiddos. Um, awesome. So, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. And Will recently wrote a book, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Yeah, see. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But this is the book right here. I'll, I'll be Vanna White. I'll be the, I'll be the person who displays it. Um, this book is called Seen. It is incredible. We're going to dive into a lot of this. Yeah. Um, but let me set up sort of what we're talking about today. So, as, as Wes said, we're starting this two-week series called The Elephant in the Room. And that's an expression the elephant in the room. It's an expression for something that's painfully obvious that it's in the room. You can't miss it, but yet nobody really wants to name it. Nobody really wants to talk about it. Nobody really wants to say, hey guys, there's an elephant in the room, right? And so we felt months ago when we were praying and planning our sermon series for you know, this, 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 these next few months, this chunk of the end of 2021, uh, we felt like God was leading us and guiding us to do a series on mental health called The Elephant in the Room. Because here's what we realize, and, and Will and I have had lots of conversations offline, if you will, about this, is there is still a stigma attached to the idea of mental health. Now, that stigma varies. And I'd say it varies across family to family. It varies across generation. It varies across a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say that there's a stigma that's attached currently to mental health, and, and it varies in this way. Some of us, um, we might not even fully believe in that being a thing, that, you know, Therapists are out to take your money. You know, we, we've sort of heard some of this before. Um, others of us might celebrate others that maybe do some things to better their mental health and celebrate them. But for us, we're not interested. That's not really for us. Um, some of us fully embrace it. Some of us are very open and talk about it. But, but regardless of whatever our current stigma, our current mindset is on it, here's what I hope the next couple weeks do. I hope the next couple weeks provide you with some encouragement and that we might be able to move to destigmatize mm -hmm. some of these things. Because, friends, if we can't talk about this in the church, where else can we talk about it? Can I get a yes on that? Yeah, amen. Um, this should be the place where we talk about these things, the most important place to, to address these kinds of big topics head on. Because whether you realize this or not, you might or you might not, we are currently in a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. And I don't undersell that word crisis. It's a mental health crisis that we're currently in. And so we felt like one of the best people to come in and talk about this was Will. Um, and, and, and so I want to dive in with this. Yeah. Um, we often talk, and Will helped me with this, honestly, about how we view a mental health crisis as only a crisis that occurs in our mind. But Will has sort of helped me through different research and through different many lunches and conversations to discover that it's not just something that happens in our mind. It's also connected to our heart as well. Yeah. So, Will, would you mind just sort of diving in? Let, let's start talking about this a little bit. Yeah, um, so I think, well, one, me mental health crisis. So we've been having a mental health crisis long before COVID and long before a pandemic. But I think we can all agree that isolation in a pandemic didn't necessarily help any of our mental health, no, right? No. So this is especially true with the younger demographics. So we've seen uh, over the last few years, and again, I've worked with kids and teens uh, as a pastor in youth ministry, next-gen ministry, um, and I remember a couple, even 
seven years ago, starting to see this trend start to change, you know. Back in the early 2000s, you know, youth pastors, we talked about, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, that was it. And all of a sudden, something new started to emerge. There was a new problem that started to emerge. I had more and more students come into my office. They were dealing with self-harm or suicide ideation. I had parents coming to me and saying, my kid's really struggling. What do I do? And at first, it was kind of concerning. Then it became more alarming as it just trended more and more and more in that direction. And so this trend has, has been kind of emerging for quite a while. And, um, and we can't ignore it. And the, the stigma that you're talking about, there, there is a stigma. And I often think it's, it's really just a, a lack of understanding, a lack of understanding what is this, this brain? How is it made up? The heart component that you mentioned or, or the, you know, not just a, a mind thing, it's a, like an emotional thing. Like what does that mean and how do we deal with that? And so a lot of what we're gonna dive in today has a lot of those, those pieces of just what is mental health and how do we simplify it and how do we break the stigma? I think first, uh, maybe the best way to start us off is just a couple of foundational principles though. Um, because most of us listening would say that we are Christians, that we follow um, Jesus, that we are you know, rooted in God's word. We wanna, you know, that is our truth, that is our foundation. So how does our truth of scripture balance into um, mental health? Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple foundational pieces that can help us with this. The first one is, we, I think we all can agree that Jesus is the source of healing right? Yes. That God is the source of healing in Jesus' name. Like James yeah, yeah. 5 gives us that, that uh, if anyone's sick, call the elders, lay hands, the prayer of faith will heal. Like, God is a source of healing. Um, so we can, we can stand on that as a tr biblical truth. I think the next thing that we can stand on is, is this idea that God is love, right? First John tells us, uh, you know, God is love. There's, a, like, there's a, a way that God communicates this essence of who he is, and love is a big component of who he is. So love obviously is a, is a core attribute here. We'll get to that in a minute, so pinpoint love for a second. And then the, the second truth I think we can, we can all agree with is that we have a God who reveals mysteries to us, right? I mean, we, the, the mystery of the gospel has been revealed through Christ, right? So, and there's these mysteries, this knowledge that he gives us, understandings that he gives us, and that is true when it comes to the brain as well. God gives us understanding. So if that is our biblical foundation, if that is like all the things that I think most of us in this room could probably all agree with, like there we go, that's our foundation. So how do we then take mental health and place it on that foundation? Well, first off, let's recognize that there's a problem. Um, there has been an increase in um, depressive symptoms, anxiety. We're the most medicated uh, country on the planet when it comes to anxiety, by the way. Um, there's been an increase in suicide ideation, in suicide attempts, and even suicide completions. Um, I, I don't want to live too much into the problem, but... For, for all of us, I think it's helpful for us to just understand the vastness of the problem. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick statistics, and, uh, and then we'll go into the hope stuff. Because yeah, yeah. I want you to, the big part of this, by the way, is not, here's the problem. The big part is, there's hope. Like, there, there's, there's some amazing things that God has given us to yeah. take steps yeah. to help this mental health crisis. But, um, but to give you an idea of this mental health crisis, suicide rates have increased 76% in ages 15 to 19. 76%. Now that's just for teenagers. Now suicide rates have actually increased among every demographic, even senior citizens. But the most alarming part is that the highest rate of increase has actually between the ages of 10 to 14 years old. Wow. We're talking like elementary kids. Yeah. And that's pre-pandemic statistics, 2019. That's the highest rate of increase. Depressive symptoms are up 21% in males, young males, and 50% in young girls. Suicide attempts among black teens, specifically, increased 73% between 91 and 2017. And, this is, this is an important statistic, there's an elevated risk of suicide among African American boys ages five to 11. Do you see younger and younger we're starting to see some really alarming things that are happening in our world. In 2020, it didn't help it. I mean, 
Uh, we know that in early 2020, from some early surveys that were done, an estimated one out of four young adults were contemplating suicide. Wow. And in March in 2020, the National Distress Hotline saw an, an increase of call volume of 893%. 893%. So what that tells us is that we all experience a lot of kind of pressure and stress on already pressured and stressed minds, yeah. that there was something else happening in our world, and a pandemic just kind of put an, a little extra pressure on that. We have, each of us, including the next generation, we've gone through 18 months of a fear and loss and a survival mentality in many ways. Yeah. Um, fear and loss cycles, the fear of, of future, fear of economy, fear of, um, of, of getting sick, right? We've, we've experienced losses. Some of us experience losses uh, in terms of our finances. Some of us experience losses in just our plans. And you've had anniversary trips and vacations and things that you were looking forward to. They all got canceled and you're just trying to bring them back, but everything's not working out maybe the way yeah. we hoped. And in some cases, we experience the loss of a loved one. Um, I was at a church last week, and the, the pastor did this thing. Raise your hand if you've lost someone in the last 18 months. Not just the COVID, but just in general. And over 50% of the hands were raised. And that tells me that we are all, to some degree, maybe a, a larger degree than others, we're all grieving, and we've all experienced a very difficult season of life. So it's not just the younger generation. It's all of us. And what do we do with that? How do, we, how do we navigate this mental health crisis? Because if you have somebody in your life who is struggling with despair or depression or high anxiety, or maybe someone in your life who's struggling with suicide ideation, you might feel, you might feel trapped. You might wonder if you're doing everything right. You might, you might wonder if there's anything you can do. And today, I think the biggest message I want us to all to know is that you might not be the only solution to their healing, but you can actually play a part to contribute to their healing because God has wired our brains in a specific way that we, through love and empathy, which we'll get to in a second, through love and empathy, we can help influence healing even when we're in despair. Yeah, yeah, that's such a good word. And, and I'm glad that I'm glad that you named sort of that, that God wired our brains and God wired us, created us to, to be this way. Because yeah. um, there's this amazing thing where sometimes I think we, you know, it's, it's the word despair. And it's the word you're going to use a lot today. It's the word you use a lot in seeing is we get trapped and we, we, feel, we feel trapped in despair and almost that there is no hope. Mm. That's why I love your message of, of there is hope because there's hope in the way that God created us yeah. to allow love to be this, this healing component yeah. to help our mind. So, so tell us a little bit about how the brain, sort of, sort of how, how is the brain put together and how does it connect to the heart and, and help us some of this? Because what yeah. you do an incredible job at is making this really like medical kind of stuff that I fall asleep reading a paragraph in or I can't understand it. Yeah. You make it simple for us to understand. Yeah. To understand how did God create our minds to think? Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm very thankful. So, you know, I wrote scene with Dr. Chinway Williams, mm -hmm. who is the medical yeah. side, and she is a, a brilliant mind. And uh, her and I really did. We worked hard on the messaging to bring complex complexities of our, our brain is complex, by the way. <laughs> it's very complex. But to really try to simplify it so that we can understand some of the common functions and the predictable functions of our brain. So God created our brain. And he created our brain in a way that it does predictable things. Just like we can predict our heart is going to beat at a certain beats per minute, most, for most of us, in a, in a range. Um, we can predict that when we have too much cholesterol, we now know that that can create high blood pressure or, or other elements, right? Like there's parts of our body that, that just do predictable things under certain circumstances. And when it comes to our brain, our brain is no different. Um, the Bible has a lot to say about the heart, by the way. But where, where does the heart live? Well, the heart lives within the brain. The, that you have, the simplest way to explain this is you have two sides of your brain. You have the right side of your brain and you have the left side of your brain. And uh, there's a lot of other components, but if you just split the, the brain in two, there's some predictable common groupings that take place. On the right side of your brain, 
it's predominantly where your emotional processing takes place. I would say this is where your heart is. So when the Bible says, guard your heart, when it says, create in me a new heart, it's really the right side of the brain is the heart, metaphorically, that the Bible talks about. Um, the left side is your logical processing. So this would be what we would say the mind, right? The, the thought processing. In a healthy brain, we feel emotions, we logically process back and forth, right? Um, you hear a crashing sound in your house, you hear glass shattering, immediately your emotional side of your brain goes, wah, 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 like something happened, right? Uh, you're alarmed, your blood pressure starts to rise, your heart rate starts to rise, but then from that emotional processing, you you shift over to logical processing of investigating. You look around and you see that a picture had fallen off the, off the wall. So now you're able to logically process, okay, someone didn't break into my house, there's not a bear chasing me, and a picture had just fallen off the wall. Yeah. So now from that logical processing, we can then shift over and decrease the, the, the emotional processing. We take a deep breath, we're like, ah, okay, I'm gonna go clean it up, no big deal. Over time, cortisol levels decrease, no big deal. Well, that's all healthy processing. The problem is, is that when we go through life and we constantly perceive our social environment, our work environment, our, um, our just the pressures of life, uh, that we can constantly kind of stay in, stay in this state of chronic stress. So cortisol, a stress hormone that most of us have heard about, can kind of, kind of drip, 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 and it can elevate our, left, our, our right side processing so much and it almost creates this despairing. So think of, think of despair as a dispairing between the right and the left side of the brain. And this is one of the hardest things that someone can face because when you're experiencing despair and someone asks you, how do you feel? Oftentimes the answer is, I don't know. Or they might say, I feel numb. And the reason why is because when we have all of this emotional energy and all this cortisol that's pumping in our bodies, we need our logical processing in order to process our emotions into words because our language processing exists on the left side of the brain. And when the two sides aren't, aren't connected, we just can't do it. As one theologian talked about despair, it's like the dark night of the soul. Psychologists call it an emotional detachment when this takes place that there's this, this disconnection. And, um, and this is why oftentimes when people are experiencing despair or high anxiety, they feel trapped. Uh, this is why in some cases, young people will um, take steps towards self-harm because they're just trying to feel something. Uh, even even at-risk high behavior is sometimes the result of just trying to feel something because the brain is so detached. So this is predictable. This is what we know. The brain is wired to respond this way. In, in a good, healthy sense, when it's short-term stress, i.e. a bear chasing you, that's helpful. But when we're perceiving our world as constant bears, when the pace of our life is constantly perceiving alarm in emergency, that's what creates a problem. It's operating in crisis every single, exactly. every single day, yeah. every single moment. Yeah. yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. But here's the cool thing. So that's all the bad news, but here's the good news. Just as much as the brain does predictable things in stress and with high cortisol levels, the brain does predictable things when we experience love and empathy. Connection, research shows us that connection plays a huge part in healing despair and anxiety. Oxytocin, another hormone that you may have heard of, it's, it's an emotionally bonding hormone. Um, it's very much a key player in parent-child relationship, but it actually plays a part throughout our entire life. When we feel seen, i.e. why we call the book seen, when we feel seen, when we feel love and empathy, oxytocin is released in our bodies and in our brains, and it can help us to feel safe. It can kind of even reroute back to early childhood when we feel nurtured, wow. even when we're experiencing anxiety and despair, and it can actually decrease that despair feeling and bring the two sides of the brain back together. It actually helps re-engage the left side of the brain, the logical processing. Wow. So... God wired our brains in a way to experience this love and empathy in moments of despair, in moments of dis despair that despairs, as you put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For us to then find connection and healing and love through something that really this attachment starts happening in the first six months of, you know, first six months of our lives. Yeah. It's incredible. 
Actually, think, from day one. Day honestly. one, really, yeah. yeah. From yeah. day one, it begins. Yeah, I mean, what, what an incredible reminder of the intentionality that, that God created us. Yeah. I mean, the, in the mind and, and the heart and everything. So I want to ask a question. Um, this is pretty direct, but, but I think we needed, you know, if we're going to call it the elephant in the room, we have to have direct, direct questions. Um, so here's the question. Um, can a follower of Jesus that's faithful, you know, you know, by all accounts, you know, you know, doing the things they should do, can they experience despair, depression, and anxiety? Absolutely. So let me frame the question a little different, though. Is a follower of Jesus human? Because to experience anxiety, um, anxiety isn't necessarily a bad, like stress isn't bad per se. When the bear's chasing you, know. you yeah, run. Yeah, when, when the bear's chasing you, you want that. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. you know, you, wanna, you want your brain to do something that causes you to act. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, to feel, uh, you know, sad emotions, that's not a bad thing. That's a human thing. To experience these, these challenging emotions, that's not a bad thing. Um, I think one of the things that we've done at times with our logical processing, and sometimes our logical interpretation of scripture, is that we've de-emotionified. I don't even know if that's a word. It's a word now. <laughs> de-emotionified. I've never said that. <laughs> we've, we've eliminated the emotional factor as we've read even some of our Bible stories. Like we read them so analytically and so logically because we're reading from top to bottom and we, we miss the context sometimes of time and space. And sometimes we miss the emotion of what people are feeling. Yeah. But there are men and women of God throughout scripture that experience very strong emotions. I would even say there's some clear examples of men, powerful men of God, women of God, who experience deep despair um, there, there's even one, I mean, I think of Elijah. Okay, Elijah is this great prophet. I mean, Elijah. I mean, he did things that are really cool. He saw things that, that are really cool. He prayed prayers that were amazing. Um, and then God moves in amazing ways. Like, he prayed that God would do this thing with the water and the dry and the fire came, right? It was, a, it was just incredible. And Elijah saw all that. And then he gets threatened, and he faces a deep despair yeah. in a big way. I mean, look at First Kings. I think we have it where we can look at it. Yeah. So Elijah was afraid. A man of God? I mean, this, this man, Elijah, the prophet, was afraid? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can't be afraid if you're a Christian. You can't be afraid if you're a man of God, a woman of God, because the Bible says that, you know, uh, perfect love drives out all fear. So we're not supposed to be afraid. Well, just because Elijah was afraid doesn't mean he didn't have faith. Just because Elijah felt fear doesn't mean that he was overcome or overtaken by fear. Now, in this case, we can you know, kind of see that Elijah goes down a path that isn't necessarily a healthy path. But to acknowledge emotions doesn't make us less faith-filled. You know, yeah. Every emotion should be acknowledged. But not every emotion should be acted upon. Say that, that one mean? more time. That's, I think that's, that's, that's crucial for today. Say yeah. that one more time. Every emotion should be acknowledged. But not every emotion should be acted upon. So it's okay for Elijah to be afraid. It's okay for him to feel fear. It's okay for him to share that he's afraid. Yeah. Obviously, he shared in such a way that it was written in Scripture. You know, like, we have it here. It's okay for that, but what we do with it matters. How we process that, how we take healthy steps matters, i.e. mental health. Like, yeah. Mental health is just taking healthy steps, just like we take healthy steps in yeah. our eye care and our dental care. We wanna take healthy steps with our, our brain care, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Elijah was afraid, and you can put that scripture back up, and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. So this is something. Elijah is on the verge of experiencing despair, and what does he do? He isolates. This isn't necessarily a good step for Elijah. He took his servant with him everywhere. He should have kept his servant, honestly, because here he was afraid, and he didn't know what to do, so he just started to run from the negative emotions. And then uh, he himself, on a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, he sat under it, and he prayed that he might die. 
I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he laid down under a bush and he fell asleep. So obviously Elijah, man of God, is facing really a, a crisis here. Yeah. And, and so much so he goes into a despair even with suicide ideation, or at least the desire, I mean, the desire at least to want to die, yeah. you know, um, asking God to take his life. That's a, that's, a, that's a level of despair, right? Yeah. But he was a man of God, right? Because even though we are people of God, mm-hmm. we're still human, and we experience the human experience. Mm-hmm. What we do with those emotions matters, though. And in this case, I think Elijah gives us an example of maybe some things he could have done differently. Sure. And isolation is definitely one of them. The biggest thing is when you're facing challenging emotions, you're facing challenging seasons in life, the biggest thing is to recognize that we are wired for connection, one with our Heavenly Father, but also with one another. And people play a critical part of our healing because that's how our brains are wired. Yeah, that's so good. We got a few more minutes, so I got two more questions for you, mm-hmm. two more things. The first one, I want to spend a moment talking about acknowledging mm-hmm. that emotion. Because as you said, sometimes we can get to a place, this isn't just for teens, it's for all of us. We get to a place where when someone asks how we're feeling, we couldn't even name it. We yeah. can't name it because we're just almost numb. We're almost stuck. Yeah. And, and there's a resource. We have them in the lobby. We're, um, we're going to have some other stuff in the lobby too. But there's a free resource um, that, that you all at, at Orange and, and your team made called Feelings Wheel that can help someone be able to name an emotion or, or maybe start thinking once again if we're going to go you know left brain right brain and begin logically thinking about what is that emotion and to name it yeah. um and and you call this or you, you stress the importance of this um by talking about this release that happens from emotion or an emotional exhale yeah so would you be able to talk a little bit about that for us and i got one more question to wrap us yeah up. so but, when when somebody's experiencing despair or mm-hmm. anxiety the best thing we can do is to help them emotionally exhale so mm-hmm. imagine the right side of the brain is so you know there's so much emotion there it's like taking a big, deep breath of air and not being able to exhale. And if we all did that, <gasps> after a while, our faces would turn red and you know, we'd hold it as long as we could and we'd either go <laughs> or we'd pass out, right? And the same is true with our emotions. We either start to release that. We have healthy ways to emotionally exhale or it comes all out in a panic attack, an anxiety attack or, or other means, right? So it's important for us to kind of get that right side of the brain to be able to have that pressure release. And the best way that we can help somebody to do that is by seeing them on a deeper level. Mm-hmm. Um, the way I like to, to say this, and Dr. Chinway and I wrote this in the book, is that we, we have to see beyond the behavior to see the emotion. So mm-hmm. a quick analogy of this would be, you know, your 13-year-old comes home and you know, she's upset, she throws her backpack down, and she's like mad, and she, you go, what's going on? You go, she goes, oh, I failed my test, and it was a big test, and Miss Johnson didn't give me the right study guide, because they always blame the teacher, right? Um, all always. the teachers are like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and this, and, and she just starts telling you. And what you do as a parent is we see right brain activated kid, and what do we do? We meet them with left brain logic. We go, well, honey, you didn't, you didn't pass because you didn't study. You actually have to study in order to pass a grade, you know? And last night, I told you to study. Instead, you were over there on the tickety-tock dancing away. Tickety-tock, yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Just doing your thing. I don't know any of the dances where I try them. Yeah, I know, right? (laughs) And you might even throw in a spiritual zinger. You know, like, God only helps those who help themselves. Which isn't even even true. That's the best part. You just toss that in. Not even true. (laughs) And what does your daughter do? That in this case, your 13-year-old daughter will ra- roll her eyes mm-hmm. and say, you just don't understand. Like everyone answered it. Seems like they know. Yeah. <laughs> Let me there. tell you what your 13-year-old daughter in this case, or your wife, or your spouse, or your, your friend at work, what they're really saying. What they're really saying is you don't see me. That's what they're really saying. You're not seeing my heart. You're not seeing the emotion. So it's not that all that's wrong. We need to lead our kids to understanding there's consequences to our non-actions of study, right? Mm-hmm. Like we need, to, we need to help build resilience, but it's not a matter of not doing that. It's a matter of when we do that. That when we see a right brain activated person, we have to meet them with right brain. We have to meet them with love, with empathy. And then we allow that right brain energy to decrease, then we'll be able to, to meet them with, with left brain logic. So I, I like to say it this way, you have to win the heart before you can lead the mind. So 
the way this might look, you know, your 13-year-old daughter comes home, she throws her backpack down, you go, honey, what's wrong? She goes, oh, I'm just mad, it's failed my test, and Miss Johnson, you go, oh, you failed your test? Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. Here, sit down, sit down, tell me about it. Well, you know, Miss Johnson didn't think she, we, I thought we were on chapter five and we were on chapter six. And you're thinking all those same thoughts. You know, you're thinking about God TikTok. only helps those who help them say yeah, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just yeah. don't say them <laughs> yeah. in that moment. Instead, you recognize that there's a right brain activated person, you know, emotional activated, and you meet them with love and empathy. Yeah. And you say, maybe you even say something like, you know, if I failed my test, I'd be pretty disappointed too. Because when you were 13, you would feel exactly the same way. If your coworker did that, you would feel the same way. Like, so you get the idea that you would feel that way. You just have to remember that you would feel that way and share that. Meet them right where they are. And then after that emotional exhale, after you allow them to process all that out, 10 minutes later, then you can say, hey, is there anything you think you could have done differently? It, may be, it might not be 10 minutes, by the way. It might be 30 minutes. If it's your spouse, wait a day, you know? Um, but, or a couple. Or a couple, <laughs> you know. Give it some time. Give it, allow, allow for a couple exhales there. Um, but my point is, is that it's not that we don't engage the logical processing. We just have to make sure that we're meeting logical processing with a logically activated mind. And when you have a right brain activated mind, you want to you wanna meet right brain with right brain. Yeah. And you, sh you shared um, last service an example of, of this, another example of this in scripture. I'm going to say real quick, and you can add in anything yeah. before I go to the last question, of, of you know, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Mm. And when you think about that moment, that's a moment where Jesus could have totally gone logical mm -hmm. and said, I don't know why y'all are crying. I'm going to just give me a minute and I'm going to go race him. Like, what's, what's up? But as you shared last service, in that moment, Jesus met that emotion with emotion by weeping. He, he, he was weeping for the sheer grief that was in that moment. Do you might take just a moment to, to unpack that a little more? Because it was so good. Yeah. You, you, you sort of, you, that was Jesus living this out, if you will. Yeah, John 11 you know, Jesus wept, so the shortest verse in the Bible. And some theologians have interpreted that as Jesus wept because he was disappointed at the lack of faith. I don't think that's true. And the reason why I don't think that's true is because in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us to mourn with those who mourn. And we also know from Jewish culture that they would, like, mourn for days. Like, they were, like, they were professional mourners. That would help, just kind of help people to emotionally, no, really, there were. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they would help them emotionally exhale out and grieve and grieve well. And we've really lost that in our culture. Mm -hmm. We want to avoid that at all costs. And, um, and what we see in Jesus is he shows up, he, he talks with Mary and Martha for a little bit, but this time passes, and the, it, Scripture even says he was deeply moved, and then it comes to this point where he gets to the tomb and he just weeps. Because Jesus, yes, was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. And in that moment, he allowed himself to experience a human experience, the grief and the loss of a friend. Yeah. Now, he knew what was about to happen. He knew that he was going to say, Lazarus, come out of the tomb, and Lazarus was going to be healed. But in that moment, he just paused, and he met people right where they were. He wept with those who wept. He empathized with their pain, and he saw them to a point that he sat with them for a moment yeah. in that pain. Yeah. Now, he didn't stay there. There's hope, mm -hmm. right? And he started to speak life. Yeah. And to life, when Jesus speaks life, people rise from the dead, you know? Like, so he started speaking life. And life came. And we can do the same thing. But we have to first meet people where they are. Meet right brain with right brain. See them on a deep level. Then let's speak some life. Yes, it is important for us to still speak life and affirm people and move people to the truth of Scripture. But we first have to meet them right where they are. And then we can help them to develop grit. Because we want grit, right? We want the ability to overcome negative emotions. If you're over the age of 50, you might have even thought, like, what happened to the resilience of this generation? Back in my day, we walked uphill both ways to school, you know, and in the snow. Yeah? And in Florida, in the snow. In Florida, in the snow. It was absolutely impossible. And, <clears throat> but my point is, is sometimes we can look at that and just say, we just need to toughen them up. But and I, don't, I don't have time to get into this, but so much has changed in our yeah. culture that the, the structures that we had 50 years ago don't exist today to help kids with the resilience that they need to overcome these negative emotions. So we have to, as the older generations, we have to recognize that things have changed. And the best way to help them is to help them to realize, yes, this is a tough world, but it's also an emotional world. And that with love and empathy, we can actually help influence and heal the brain and lead them towards wholeness.
It's one last question. Yeah. What's the most important thing you would say for followers of Jesus in this room, watching online, followers of Jesus in here that, that are struggling themselves with mental health? Followers of Jesus in here who know somebody, a loved one or a friend that's struggling with mental health? What's the most important thing to keep in mind when it comes to God's perspective on this? How would you close this out? I would say one is, if you're hurting today, um, I want you to know that God sees you, that you don't suffer alone, that you're not broken, that you may be going through a challenging season, but it truly is just a season. Recognize that there's always hope. Please hear me that there's always hope. I know it feels like it'll always feel this way because of some of the pain and hurt that you've experienced but it won't always feel this way. There's always hope. So just keep breathing. Just keep breathing. Don't make a permanent decision on a temporary problem. Just keep breathing. There's hope. And reach out and talk to someone. Isolation is not your friend. You're wired for two things. You need to have secure attachment with your Heavenly Father to feel seen by the Heavenly Father. But you're also wired to, to feel need. The need that you have is to feel secure attachment from others. So have a conversation. Share with somebody what you're going through. Don't let the stigma hold you back, thinking that they're going to think less of me. No, 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 not at this church. <laughs> they're going to love you. They're going to see you. So don't walk alone. And then the, the second thing I would say, if you have somebody who's hurting in your life, a neighbor, a coworker, maybe a grandkid, a a kid, um, slow down, see them, have conversations. Conversations can help heal. And you might not be the, the sole source of this. I don't want you to hear me and put too much pressure on your own shoulders. You're a part of a wraparound approach. So doctors may be needed, just like we need to go to the, the heart doctor sometimes or the eye doctor or the dentist. Um, sometimes we need to go to a counselor or a psychiatrist. Sometimes medicine is needed because our brain is an organ that... Yes, we can have faith and take healthy steps, but sometimes medicine can help us and our bodies to heal, and so that's okay. So um, if you have someone in your life hurting, you can be a part of that wraparound approach, but understand that you are a part of it, so seek help as well, um, especially if you have a kid in your life or someone close to you that's dealing with some suicide ideation. Like, Take steps to get help. Um, don't navigate that alone. Will, thank you. Can we thank God for Will this morning? I want to invite our worship team up, and, and Will, as they're making their way up here, we're going to sing one more song together, and our, and our altar will be open. So during the song, if you'd like to come up, you can kneel and pray here. You can make your seat a place of prayer as well. And don't forget, you can lift a hand, and someone from our prayer team would be happy to pray with you. But Will, would you, would you mind yeah. praying for us as we go back into worship this Absolutely. morning? God, I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your grace. I thank you that you see us, that we are not, a left, we are not left alone, that you are with us. And God, I pray today that you would um, you'd give us the courage to reach out, to talk to someone if we're hurting today. I pray that you would help us to know that, that, that you're with us here right now in this moment. God, that you see us. Lord, I pray for those of us who maybe have drifted away from following you, I pray that this moment would, would lead us back to you, recognizing that we need you, we need your guidance, your love, your grace. I pray for those of us who have someone in our lives that's hurting. I pray that you'd give us the wisdom, the courage to have a conversation, to show up, to see them. Give us patience, Lord. Help us to simply meet them right where they are with love and empathy as you give us your love and empathy. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, would you mind standing? Let's worship together as we sing one more song. <clears throat>